Well, good afternoon. Welcome back to this second of our two Curry Lectures in Law and Religion. It's a special honor to have all of you here, and a special welcome to members of the Board of Trustees and the Law School Council, some of whom are in attendance, and we're delighted to have you here. And also a special welcome to Mr. Curry, who has again graced us with his presence. I hope he's found the auditorium and is here, but he will be here at the reception if he's not here currently. After hearing full introductions and a scintillating lecture yesterday, it seems prudent for me to relinquish the lectern very quickly to our distinguished lecturer and have him simply continue his mastery and wizardry. I do want uh, to mention a word or two about him before letting him continue that exercise. Dr. Tierney was born and raised in North England, hence the wonderful lilt in his voice. He was educated there and then called into service during World War II. He was a prize ace fighter for the Royal Air Force. He flew, he tells me, 90 missions without mishap, which is probably a record, I suspect. He was decorated for his efforts after the war and is one of the war heroes. After World War II, he enrolled in the graduate program at Cambridge University in medieval history. He was the first prize student of the great medievalist Walter Allman and completed his dissertation there. His first teaching assignment was at Catholic University in Washington. And from there in 1959, he went to Cornell University and has remained there throughout his career and he's currently Bomar professor, University Professor of the Humanities Emeritus, and that allows him to continue to his research and to write and to be the guru on history, politics, and philosophy at Cornell. Several of you have been weaned, I suspect, on some of his primers in Western history and on church-state relations. He has also written several definitive path-breaking books with titles such as Medieval Poor Law, Foundations of Conciliar Theory, Origins of Papal Infallibility, and Law, Religion, and the Growth of Constitutional Thought. Definitive works and precious works to be savored for generations to come. His Curry Lectures this week give us a glimpse into his most recent research and writing on questions of rights, and out of that exercise will come yet another gem in the Tierney series. It is with enormous pleasure and pride that I again welcome to the lectern Dr. Brian Tierney. Thank you, John. Uh, the only trouble with these very generous introductions is that, of course, the lecturer feels he may not live up to the expectations which they inevitably arouse in the audience. Again, though, I'd like to thank the program in Law and Religion, and especially Mr. Curry for this invitation and for making the whole event possible. Yesterday, I was talking about the growth of a concept of natural rights in the jurisprudence of the Middle Ages, and some of you would have heard that talk. I mentioned then various natural rights that had emerged by about 1300. There was a, a right to the necessities of life, a right to acquire property, a, a right of self-defense. There were rights of infidels, rights in marriage. But in all this, one right was conspicuously lacking. I mean, a right to religious freedom. I remember a conversation with an old acquaintance, the theologian Hans Kung. Uh, he said to me, well, what are you going to work on next? And I said, well, I think I might investigate medieval natural rights. Huh, said Hans with a notable snort. You won't find much to investigate. And you see, he being a theologian who had suffered a little bit of mild repression himself, his mind immediately went to this one right of freedom of religion. And it is, of course, fundamental in the constitutional law of modern states. 
It's enshrined in our First Amendment and more generally in the United Nations Declaration of 1948, which says, everyone has the right to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion. This right includes freedom to change one's religion. And nowadays, it's become commonplace to maintain, John Paul II said this recently, that religious rights are the cornerstone of all other rights. But viewed in historical perspective, as a matter of fact, religious rights came last. They emerged only very slowly and painfully out of a tradition which earlier had found it much easier to acknowledge other kinds of rights. Religious rights were the most difficult to conceive of, let alone put into practice. And yet, although this medieval era was a time of religious repression, there were some doctrines, even in medieval law and religion, that were eventually used to support a later doctrine of religious rights. Our problem then is going to be to understand the process of historical development, to see how old juristic concepts could be reinterpreted and reformulated into a new doctrine under the pressure of new accumulated experiences. Let me take as a starting point the Declaration on Religious Liberty that was promulgated at Vatican Council II in 1965. It goes like this. This Vatican Council declares that the human person has a right to religious freedom. This freedom means that all are immune from coercion no one is to be forced to act contrary to his own beliefs. This right is known through the revealed word of God and through reason itself. I want to contrast that with the decree of another general council of the church, which was held exactly 750 years earlier. This is from the Fourth Lateran Council of 1215. We excommunicate and anathematize every heresy that raises itself against the holy orthodox and Catholic faith. Secular authorities must strive to exterminate all heretics pointed out by the church. And the secular authorities soon picked up the cue. This is a statute promulgated a little later in 1232 by Emperor Frederick II for all his vast domains. Heretics try to tear the seamless robe of our God. They are violent wolves. They are sons of depravity. Therefore, we draw the sword of vengeance against them. Committed to the judgment of the flames, they shall be burned alive in the sight of the people. My task as a historian is to try to explain to you how we got from there to here, from a persecution of heretics to a formal conciliar declaration on the right to freedom of religion. That modern decree of Vatican Council II that I read to you contained only the most bland and innocuous hint that the policy it proclaimed was a reversal of a policy of repression that the church had followed for many centuries. The bland and innocuous hint came in an observation that the demands of human dignity, it said, have come to be more fully known to human reason through centuries of experience. And similarly, Jacques Maritain observed in discussing human rights that our understanding of them has increased as man's moral consciousness has developed. This idea, I should say, of a growth of understanding through historical experiences is not just a novel concept based on modern historicism to justify a change in church doctrine. You, you do find the same kind of idea in some authors of these medieval centuries that I've been talking about. In the 13th century, for instance, St. Bonaventure wrote about the seeds of truth in scripture that would slowly ripen in the minds of men. And he also said, 
scripture and its mysteries cannot be understood unless the course of history is known. Such writers were not arguing that divine revelation changes, but they meant rather that our understanding of divine truth can grow and deepen in the course of the centuries. And so too our understanding of juridical norms can develop in time. And we might add that some kinds of understanding, it seems, can be achieved only by undergoing hard and bitter experiences. And so it was when we consider the theme of religious rights. <clears throat> I want to present to you a, a fairly complex historical argument, so let me lay out the, the framework of it for you in advance. We shall need, first of all, to glance for a little while at the early foundations of Christian doctrine on persecution and toleration. And then I want to consider some aspects of medieval law and religion that even then might seem favorable to a growth of religious rights. There are, there are three points I still want to consider. The, the freedom of the church from secular authority, the idea of conscience as a guide to right conduct, and, and thirdly, the emergence of a notion of natural rights that I was talking about yesterday. Then I will try to show why, in spite of all those doctrines, religious repression remained the norm all through the medieval centuries, and finally, how in the post-Reformation era, all those medieval arguments were taken up again and carried to a new conclusion, to a real defense now of religious rights. If we go back to the beginning then for a bit, from the very outset there were elements in Christian tradition that could favor either a doctrine of universal toleration or could justify persecution. Jesus himself, of course, taught a doctrine of universal love. He said, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you. Jesus disclaimed the role of a political messiah uh, who would rely on coercive force when he said, my kingdom is not of this world. Jesus called his followers to a new kind of freedom. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And yet there always was a potential for intolerance in the early Christians' disregard for all other religions. I mean, you know, their conviction that they alone knew the one true God, that all those outside the church were wandering in a wilderness of darkness and sin and error. All the same, a belief in the righteousness of one's own cause doesn't necessarily imply that you should coerce other people into joining it. And in the early days of the church, many church fathers did defend an ideal of religious freedom. Perhaps then the most eloquent statement came from Lactantius. He wrote, Liberty has chosen to dwell in religion, for nothing is so much a matter of free will as religion, and no one can be required to worship what he does not will to worship. The major change came with St. Augustine, about 400 AD. Augustine had to deal with religious dissidents in his diocese of North Africa, and eventually he called on the Roman civil authorities to repress them. Augustine justified this by citing the parable of Jesus you may recall it, about a rich man who prepared a great feast when none of the intended guests would accept the invitations, the master dispatched his servants to bring in alternative guests. But the servants told him there was still room at the table. And then the text goes on. Then the Lord said to the servant, go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in. And the key words for Augustine were those last ones, compelle intrare, compel them to come in. 
in the interpretation he gave to this parable, the guests who refused their invitation were the Jewish people who were invited but did not come. Those who accepted the second invitation voluntarily were the Gentiles who joined the church. And those who were finally compelled to enter were heretics who had left the church and who could licitly be coerced into returning. It's a bit fanciful perhaps, but Augustine's views remained enormously influential for the next thousand years. And for a thousand years the church pursued a policy of suppressing religious dissent with more or less enthusiasm and different historical epochs, but without any real doctrine of religious rights. But before I turn to this theme, however, I want, as I said I would, to consider those aspects of medieval law and religion that, that could, and, and really that eventually did, though only after centuries of vicissitudes, contribute to a later doctrine of religious freedom. I, I said there were three elements I wanted to consider. The, the, the most obvious way in which the leaders of the medieval church contributed to a later doctrine of religious freedom, quite unintentionally of course, was by their assertion of the freedom of the church from control by secular ruling authorities from the emperor or kings. It's a very important theme in Western history. In the Middle Ages, there was never just one hierarchy of government exercising absolute authority over a subject population. There were always two hierarchies, church and state, as we say nowadays, each always encroaching on but limiting the power of the other one. And it was, you know, a fairly unusual development in the history of human cultures. In many ancient civilizations, the ruler typically was seen as some kind of divine figure, a priest king, a god emperor, providing a necessary link between heaven and earth, between mundane things and the ultimate high gods, like an emperor of China, a, a pharaoh of Egypt, an Inca of Peru, and in that sort of traditional society, typically religious liberty was neither imaginable nor desired. But the Christian tradition was different from the very beginning. Christianity grew up in an alien class classical culture. For early Christians, the emperor, the civil authority, was not a divine figure, but a persecutor of the true faith. And even after the emperors became Christian, church leaders continued to assert an independent role for themselves. There was a classic statement came from Pope Gelasius in the last days of the Roman Empire. This was actually 496 AD. Writing to the emperor himself, the pope wrote, Two there are, August emperor, by which this world is chiefly ruled the sacred authority of the priesthood and the royal power. In the order of religion, you ought to submit yourself rather than rule. So there were two authorities in the world. There were whole areas of religious thought and practice that were excluded from the control of the imperial power. That text of Gelasius from so long ago was not forgotten. Later on, in the 12th century, it was assimilated into the canon law of the church in that decretum of Gratian that some of you heard me talking about yesterday. It, it, that ancient text of Gelasius is in Distinctio 96 of the decretum, and there it became the focus of endless commentaries that uh, went on all through the Middle Ages and into the modern era. I mentioned again for some of you who were here last time, a great canonist called Huguccio, about 1190. He wrote a commentary on this text. Here it can clearly be gathered that the each power, the apostolic and the imperial, was instituted by God, and that neither is derived from the other. 
they are independent powers. They restrain each other. And even into the 17th century, I was reading recently Grotius, the great Dutch founder of international law, uh, a Protestant, of course. But at the beginning of his first major work, he wanted first to prove that the Pope was not the temporal ruler of the whole world, and to do so, he quoted Huguccio from 1190, who in turn was commenting on the text of Gelasius from 496 AD. These central concerns of Western civilization have an endurance and a resonance, as you see. In practice, the independence of the church was asserted in endless conflicts between popes and emperors all through the Middle Ages. And the tension between the two powers prevented Christian society from ever congealing into a sort of monolithic despotism in which individual rights could never have flourished. Still, medieval popes, of course, were defending the freedom of the church as an institution. They, they were not engaged with defending the religious rights of individual Christians. But there was also in medieval discourse this second strand of argument that I mentioned, a, a persistent emphasis on the individual conscience as a guide to right conduct. This is one of those things that came to be greatly emphasized in that more humanistic and individualistic religion of the 12th century that again I was discussing yesterday. When St. Paul wrote in the Epistle to the Romans, everything that is not from faith is sin, the ordinary gloss to the Bible, which was the standard medieval commentary on the text, explained that the words not from faith meant all that is contrary to conscience is sin. In the 12th century, Peter Abelard, a philosopher, expanded the argument. He taught that an act against one's conscience was sinful, even when the conscience was in error and telling you to do the wrong thing. And Thomas Aquinas came to essentially the same conclusion. And it is surprising to some people, but the case that medieval canonists taught the same doctrine, the, the ordinary gloss to the decretals, written about 1240 and studied in law schools all over Europe for the next several centuries, declared no one ought to act against his own conscience. And he should follow his conscience rather than the judgment of the church when he is certain one ought to suffer any evil, even excommunication, rather than sin against conscience. We're not dealing here yet with a right to religious liberty, but with a duty to obey one's own conscience. But still, an emphasis on the individual conscience was an important and central element in later theories of real religious rights. The medieval position was that a, a person was doing right to follow his own conscience, but he would have to take the consequences if his, consequen if his conscience led him into illicit behavior. And this is, after all, what we are familiar with in uh, modern law in some ways. Individuals may be led by a very sincere conscience to violate the law, as in some forms of civil rights protest or some forms of anti-war protest. But uh, however much one may sympathize with their goals, the law will hold them responsible for their actions, even though they were done in good conscience. I suppose... In one sphere, the emphasis on individual conscience did lead even early on to some very limited degree of religious toleration in that uh, medieval doctrine always taught that non-Christians, Muslims and Jews could not be forcibly converted to Christianity. The, the law concerning the status of Jews was summed up again in the decretals of Gregory the Ninth promulgated in 1234, chapter 9 of the title De Judeis on the Jews, said that Jews were not to be forcibly baptized, nor despoiled of their property, 
nor were their cemeteries to be violated, nor were they to be molested in celebrating the festivals of their religion. Well, you will recognize that that is more a statement of a juridical ideal than a description of real life practice. In, in the real world of the Middle Ages, needless to say, all too often there were savage outbreaks of violence against Jewish communities. But they were typically due to outbreaks of, mod, of mob violence. They, they were contrary to the established law of the church. So far, we've got two themes of medieval law and religion that might have supported a doctrine of religious rights, freedom from secular control, emphasis on conscience. And the third theme is the emergence of a doctrine of individual natural rights or human rights, rights inhering in persons simply by virtue of their human nature. That was the theme of my last lecture and I'm not going to repeat it all here. Some of you will be relieved to know. But according to some recent work, the idea of natural rights grew up in jurisprudence from the late 12th century onwards and then was developed further by theologians like William of Ockham about 1330 and uh, Jean Gerson about 1400, whom I mentioned. I, I will perhaps say just a word or two more about those two. William of Ockham, a Franciscan philosopher, took an important step when he associated an idea of natural rights, which he took directly out of canon law, with the scriptural doctrine of evangelical liberty that he found especially in the epistles of St. Paul. Paul often referred to Christian liberty in phrases like the freedom we have in Christ Jesus or the freedom wherewith Christ has made us free. What Paul meant probably was just freedom from sin or freedom from all the ceremonial law of the Old Testament. But Occam used Paul's texts to argue for a natural right to freedom from any kind of tyrannical government, and especially he emphasized in the church. Not even the Pope, Occam wrote, could injure the rights and liberties granted to the faithful by God and nature. And the other fellow, Gerson, about 1400, argued in the same sort of way. He wrote that in his own day the church was oppressed by an intolerable burden of regulations and obligations imposed by the Pope and the church hierarchy. They were like snares and nets to trap simple Christians, he wrote. And he too went on to argue that there was an inherent natural right to resist oppressive authority, even in the church. This sounds almost modern, and, and Gerson's words out of context do sometimes seem to have an almost modern sound, but he was really living in, still, in, in a totally different world of thought from ours. Given all those aspects of medieval thought that I've described to you so far, uh, an emphasis on freedom of the church, an emphasis on conscience, and emerging doctrine of natural rights, you might rationally expect that at least some medieval jurists would have moved on to defend a right of religious liberty for everybody. It seems almost implicit in the arguments they're putting forward. But nothing of the sort happened. Every medieval writer who discussed this question saw heresy as a sin and a crime that was properly judged by the church and properly punished by the secular authorities. Even Gerson had really no notion of religious freedom as we conceive of it. I indeed, Gerson participated in the trial and burning of John Huss as a heretic. Gerson could defend the rights of Christians within the church, but the idea never occurred to him that heretics could have rights against the church. So, before we can understand how real religious rights emerged in the early modern world, we need to consider why they were so lacking in the theory and practice of the medieval era. There, there's a classic little book 
called The Whig Interpretation of History by Herbert Butterfield from about 50 or 60 years ago, that uh, generations of British history undergraduates have been brought up on. And in that book, uh, Butterfield warned historians against what he called present-mindedness. We should not impose our own ideas on the past, he argued, but we should try to understand each historical era in its own terms. We should try to get inside their skins, as it were. And discussing our particular question, Butterfield wrote that the sort of question we ought to ask is not, how did we get our religious liberty, but rather, why were people in former ages so given to persecution? It seems to me that both questions are legitimate ones for a historian. But obviously we can't begin to address the first one, how did we get our religious liberty, until we have come to understand the second one. Why did they persecute so much? In some areas of political thought, medieval ideas were not so very different from our own. Medieval people had quite highly developed notions of uh, representation and consent and government under law. But when we turn to this idea of religious rights, their whole mindset was so alien to ours that it takes a very considerable effort of the historical imagination to enter into their world of thought at all. Maybe we can find a starting point in a remark of that great legal historian Frederick Maitland, whom I quoted yesterday. He once wrote, in the Middle Ages, the church was a state. The church, he pointed out, had its own institutions of government, its own bureaucracy, its own laws, its own law courts. In the Middle Ages, secular political power was very fragmented. The only bond of unity that held the whole Western Christian civilization together was a bond of a common religion. Nowadays, a principal focus of our loyalty is, of course, the state. We look to the state to protect our security and liberty. To be a stateless person in the 20th century is a very unhappy fate. The other side of the coin is that we do not tolerate people who are perceived of as traitors to the state. We charge them with treason. We inflict punishment on them, sometimes capital punishment in extreme cases. A, a plea of personal sincerity that the traitor acted from a perfectly good, clean conscience is not a sufficient defense. Medieval people regarded heretics in much the same way. They held them guilty of treason to the church, and they treated them as traitors. They actually took over the Roman law of treason technically and applied it specifically to the condemnation of heretics. When a common religion defined the whole way of life of a society, to reject it was to cut oneself off from the community, to become a sort of outlaw, and a dangerous outlaw at that, from a medieval point of view. Medieval people were so convinced of the truth of their religion that they could never see dissent from the accepted faith as arising simply from intellectual error, from a mistake in judgment. They thought that heresy must somehow stem from malice, from a perverted will that quite deliberately chose evil rather than good, that chose Satan rather than God. And this is the root cause of all the medieval hatred of heresy. The heretics were seen not only as traitors to the church, but as traitors to God. To medieval people, it seemed that they had rejected God's truth and God's love out of pride and self-love, love of their own self-contrived errors. They were all headed for eternal damnation, of course, but unless they were restrained, they would lure countless others to the same terrible fate. Elementary justice and charity, it seemed, required that they be rooted out. And the Inquisition that pursued this task with increasingly harsh and cruel measures 
was accepted as a necessary safeguard of Christian society. Some of you must remember sometime having seen George Bernard Shaw's play, St. Joan, about uh, the trial of Joan of Arc. And uh, with his characteristic taste for paradox, Shaw, of course, gave by far the longest and the best speech in the play to the Inquisitor, defending the Inquisition. And the Inquisitor said all the things I've just been saying to you, only in more eloquent and colorful language. And as the speech rolls on and on and you sit there in the theater, you find yourself for a moment almost convinced. Almost. Thinking about the Inquisition might remind us of two aphorisms that Lord Acton liked to quote. The first is the well-known saying of Madame de Stael, to understand all is to forgive all. And the other one, uh, less indulgent, is from the Duc de Broglie. We should beware of too much understanding, lest we end up with too much forgiving. Neither aphorism is altogether satisfying for a historian. Our task surely is to understand as fully as we possibly can. But we don't have to condone everything that we have tried hard to understand. And when everything possible has been said in mitigation, this medieval theory and practice of persecution will seem abhorrent to most of us. Still, a critical observer looking back over this long tract of history might think that Butterfield had got his question upside down after all. One might suppose that persecution is in fact the normal pattern of human conduct. Perhaps the real question that a historian has to answer is not why were they so given to persecution, but rather why are we so committed to an ideal of religious liberty? And that's the final topic that we have to try and consider. In the context of medieval life, religious persecution seemed both right and necessary to nearly all sensible people. The, the Reformation of the 16th century created a different historical context which led to new understandings of Christian teaching based on very new historical experiences. The changes that came about I think, were not due to any specific teachings of the first great reformers. It would indeed be hard to discern any seeds of religious liberty in Martin Luther's rantings against Catholics and Jews, or, or in Calvin's grim-lipped defense of persecution after the execution of Servetus for heresy in Geneva. Religious liberty arose out of a play of contingent events that nobody had planned and nobody had foreseen. Between 1500 and, say, 1700, a new web of causation was created. Europe experienced a series of savagely destructive wars of religion that often ended in stalemates and experienced a splintering of religious unity into innumerable completing sects and congregations. In many countries, religious groups who resisted an established faith found themselves persecuted. Huguenots in France, Roman Catholics and Puritan separatists in England, Lutherans in the Catholic parts of Germany, and every kind of dissenter from Catholic orthodoxy in Spain. And in each group country, the groups that were being persecuted, both Catholic and Protestant, sought toleration for their own beliefs. But their demands in the early stages of the Reformation were not based on any devotion to religious liberty as such. Each religious group believed that it ought to be tolerated because it was right. And typically it believed that all its adversaries ought to be suppressed because they were wrong. Looking back a bit disdainfully on this whole situation, 
the English historian John Figgis wrote of the competing sects, it was only the inability of any single one to destroy all the others which finally secured liberty. Rather harsh conclusion. Well, there is truth in it, but it is not quite the whole truth. The religious turmoil of this age gradually inspired just a few brave spirits, and then more and more, to begin to argue for real religious freedom. Among Protestant groups, the Baptists always condemned coercion in matters of religion, and, and that execution f of Servetus for heresy in Calvin's Geneva in 1553 evoked a response from Sebastian Castellio on heretics, whether they should be persecuted, which I think perhaps provided the first full-scale argument for freedom of conscience. Uh, th there were arguments for religious freedom in Holland at this time, and a little later on in England during the Civil War of the 1640s. Some leaders of the numerous dissident sects there began to realize that their own version of religious truth could only flourish in a climate of genuine religious liberty for everybody. The, the Presbyterian leader, Richard Baxter, served as a chaplain in one of Oliver Cromwell's regiments for a time. And looking back on the experience, he noted disapprovingly that among the common soldiers, he wrote, their most frequent and vehement disputes were for liberty of conscience, as they called it, that every man might not only hold, but preach and do in matters of religion whatever he pleased. That was a very odd, subversive idea, Richard Baxter thought. The, the new defenses of religious rights that were gradually growing up from about 1550 onwards, were based on three main lines of argument, I think. The, the, the first was skepticism, the other expediency, and the other a more genuine appeal to underlying principles of Christian faith. The skepticism was not at first uh, about the central doctrines of Christian religion, but, but just about all the tortuous theological subtleties that were dividing the Christian groups from one another. But, but later on, of course, in the Enlightenment era, a defense of toleration was often associated with indifference or hostility to all religious teachings. I think we should not uh, underestimate our debt to the Enlightenment Nowadays, we're all post-enlightenment people. And no doubt, the skeptical mockery of a Voltaire was needed to expose all the lingering cruelties and superstitions of the established religion. But perhaps in the end, skepticism is not enough. Humans are religious animals, and if their old faiths are worn away by too much doubt, they are likely to invent new and more savage substitutes. We have seen plenty of that in the 20th century, and France saw it at the end of the 18th century. Another line of argument for religious tolerance was simple expediency. I think the greatest theoretical exponent of this was the great French political philosopher Jean Baudin. He acknowledged that religious uniformity was desirable. He conceded that the state had a perfect right to suppress religious dissidents if it chose to do so. But he argued that if a new religion in fact became so entrenched that it could not be suppressed without a danger of civil war, then the most expedient policy would be to tolerate it. He was thinking of the Huguenots in France, of course. The problem with the argument from expediency is that in many circumstances, uh, toleration is not the most obviously expedient policy. Often it seems more expedient just to crush dissent quick and early. The third argument that 
people began to advance for religious freedom was, I think, ultimately the most important one. Over and over again in this new era, the idea was asserted, though, though not yet generally accepted, for these are still dissident voices that we're talking about, but the idea was asserted that the practice of persecution was radically contrary to the religion that Jesus had first taught. Castellio, whom I just mentioned, wrote of religious persecution that Satan himself could not devise anything more repugnant to the nature and will of Christ. In France, Pierre Bale framed a case for toleration precisely as a commentary on the text, compel them to enter the very same text that Augustine had used to defend persecution. But Bale argued in a different spirit that to understand the words of Christ in that way was, he wrote, contrary to the essential spirit of the gospel itself. He was a man of uh, skeptical temperament, but the same kind of argument was put forward by writers of fervent religious faith. Roger Williams presented various considerations in favor of religious freedom, but the fundamental one was that persecution was, he said, directly contradicting the spirit and mind and practice of the Prince of Peace. And in this new historical context, all the old medieval strands of argument that I outlined for you about the freedom of the church from secular control, the overriding authority of conscience, the existence of natural rights, they were all taken up again and interwoven in new ways and transmuted into new arguments for a new vision of a universal right to religious freedom. The old claim that the church ought not to be controlled by secular rulers was now taken to mean that the civil magistrate had no right to interfere with anybody's personal choice of religion. Uh, Protestant dissenters like to point out that the civil magistrate was no more infallible than the pope and bishops had been. If uh, he was allowed to persecute at all, he might persecute the wrong people. As one of them observed, he who is in error may be the constrainer of him who is in the truth. A very disagreeable situation. Another argument that was presented by John Milton pointed out that progress in the understanding of divine revelation could be achieved only through reasoned discourse and without government coercion or control. Medieval theologians had sometimes envisaged a gradual progress in the understanding of Christian truth, the understanding of scripture through the course of the centuries. The new insight was that such progress required freedom of thought and expression. The old claim for freedom of the church was turning into a claim for the freedom of individual Christians. Views about the individual conscience were changing too. In the 17th century, most people still adhered to that medieval notion that religious dissent sprang from malice rooted in sin but by then, alternative opinions were, were being expressed too. In the years of civil war in England, it became increasingly different, difficult for men of good will and good sense to believe that their neighbors, sometimes men they had fought with side by side in a common cause, were in fact actuated by active malice to do the work of Satan in the world because they disagreed on some tortuous point of theology. But that had been the essential basis of the medieval abhorrence of heresy, that they were activated by actual malice. When differences of religious opinion could be seen as effects of intellectual error rather than of perverted will, the way was open to reconsider the proper attitude to them. An English writer, William Walwyn, about 1640, took up that text I mentioned earlier, whatever is not of faith is sin, the same text that medieval authors had always used in their discussions of conscience, but he carried it to a new conclusion. Every man of whatsoever opinion ought to have liberty of conscience. 
The Anglican divine Jeremy Taylor argued similarly for freedom of conscience. He wrote, If God will not be angry at men for being deceived by an erring conscience, why should men be angry at one another? To compel a person to act against his conscience was now sometimes compared to physical rape. In the pungent language of Roger Williams, it was spirit rape and soul rape. And the final outcome of all this was a fusion between this new idea of religious liberty and the older idea that we traced earlier of natural rights. Freedom of conscience came to be seen as an inalienable natural right or human right. William Penn, for instance, wrote, I ever understood liberty of conscience to be the natural right of all men. As a Quaker, Penn stood a bit, a long way, outside the mainstream of religious thought of his time, but his eminently respectable contemporary, an Anglican Bishop Burnett, expressed a similar view. I have long looked on liberty of conscience as one of the rights of human nature, antecedent to society, which no man can give up. And going back right to the roots of the Christian tradition, Burnett undertook a translation of Lactantius and in his introduction again defended freedom of conscience. <coughs> and John Locke too, in his very influential letter concerning toleration, wrote that liberty of conscience is every man's natural right. So by the end of the 17th century, reasonably adequate theories of religious rights had been formed and slowly, slowly the theories came to be implemented in the constitutional states of the West. We need to ask perhaps in conclusion what relevance this distinctively Western Christian experience could have for our world of many religions and many diverse cultures. Some critics have suggested that all the brave new pronouncements about human rights, including religious rights, simply inflate Western concepts into universal values and then assume without question that such values are valid for all other societies regardless of their culture and history. Perhaps it is suggested all this rights talk is just another kind of Western chauvinism. And yet the actual state of the world suggests that the lessons that the West learned through so much hard and bitter experience may indeed have a universal relevance. In our world we need religious rights. New forms of religious fundamentalism are inspiring hatred and fear of all those who are outside the chosen in-group and in many regions from Northern Ireland to Sri Lanka, in the republics of the former Soviet Union, most obviously now in what was once Yugoslavia, ethnic rivalries have combined with religious animosities to produce explosive new kinds of politico-religious compounds. Religious conflict is a major source of disorder in the present world that we have to live in. <laughs> to go back to my categories, it would certainly be expedient to end all the violence committed in the name of religion nowadays. And, and perhaps a certain skepticism might be an appropriate response to the claims of our more fanatical fundamentalists. But modern pragmatism and modern skepticism may not be enough. Perhaps the only answer for all peoples will be the ones that Christians discovered so painfully when they compared the words of Jesus with all the hatreds and cruelties of their own age that is, the need for a return to the original sources of a religious tradition and a reconsideration of the original sources in the light of all our accumulated centuries of experience. Modern Christian pronouncements base religious rights on the dignity of human beings 
as children of God. But Muhammad too said, Verily, we have honored every human being. Jesus told us to love those who hate us. But Gautama Buddha also declared, Hatred does not cease with hatred. Hatred ceases only with love. Among all the great founders of the world religions, we can find an attitude of respect and compassion for the human person that is the best argument, and in the end, the only ultimately compelling argument for religious liberty. Often, contingent historical experiences and circumstances have distorted human understanding of the original revelations or intuitions that lie at the root of all our great religious traditions. So perhaps the best antidote for all the false fundamentalisms of our age might be a true fundamentalism, a return to the words and spirit and example of the great founders. Well, that was simply marvelous. And I think the only thing we should do is to say thank you so much to Dr. Tierney for yet another scintillating lecture and to invite you to enjoy a reception with him and with Mrs. Tierney and with our other guests uh, outside in the foyer here and to enjoy both the food for thought that we've had uh, for the past hour and the food that my good colleagues in the Law and Religion program have prepared outside. Thank you so much for coming, and thank you, Dr. Tierney, for his wonderful remarks.